And were you talking to me? No, I'm good. Oh, okay. All right, good evening. Today is Monday, August 23rd, 2021. This is a regular meeting of the Board of Education. I'd like to call the meeting to order. I have a motion to call the meeting to order. Lori, second, Laura, all in favor? All right, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of the United States. All right, let's start with uh, comments by the board. Lori, do you have any comments tonight? Um, it's great to see so many people out today. Um, I hope everybody is ready to start off a good school year, um, hopefully better than last year. Um, and that's it. Great. Laura? Um, I don't have really anything to say. Just thank you for everyone who came out and everyone's listening at home. And looking forward to uh, a new school year. Great. Therese, any comments? Jeez, already. <laughs> um, I have a couple of comments I wanted to make, actually, just to follow up on our last meeting. And just a couple of things, because at our last meeting, a few people referenced a JAMA article citing that um, Basically, it was stating that there was damage to kids based on mask wearing. Uh, personally, at the time, I was not aware of the article. I did go back to research it myself. It was not an actual article. It was a letter of intent. It was a research letter. And it has since been revoked. Um, the person, the lead author of that article, has been terminated from his institution in Germany. And I'm not bringing this up because I think that we're right now in a very difficult time and there is a lot of misinformation circulating, a lot of distrust, a lot of emotion. And I just want to encourage everybody to um, know your resources and ask people who know more than you do. I've been doing a lot of that this summer and trying to pass on any knowledge that I've been able to um, attain through those measures. And I think it's really important that we stay focused on what science has shown, the fact that science has brought us to a point where we do have vaccination, we understand the virus, we can treat it and not have as much um, morbidity as we have, but we still have some uh, for sure and some mortality. And our numbers have exponentially risen since that time. Um, I know from my colleagues at New York Presbyterian that around that meeting, our, their numbers were hovering in the mid-teens. There uh, were around 17, I think, was their low. Today, they're at 209 admissions. My own institution, we were at six. We are now over 120. Montefiore was at six. In the Bronx, they're now at 69. White Plains Hospital had zero, and they had now have 20 um, people admitted. 90% across the board are all unvaccinated. And I know this is a, um, something that people are struggling with and maybe hesitant about. I just want to encourage everybody to please inform yourself. Ask your physician, discuss your own personal case with them and um, make good decisions for everybody. I feel like in the beginning of my career, when the varicella vaccine was first introduced, there was a lot of resistance. People did not want to get their kids vaccinated with the Varivax vaccine. It's now mandated in schools. And at that point, people were saying, well, kids weren't dying. Kids didn't die from the chicken pox. About 4 million cases a year were reported and between 100 and 150 people, children, I'm sorry, um, would die from complications from the varicella virus. We're now at a 91%, I think, vaccination rate, and we almost never hear about chicken pox anymore. In fact, when I have medical students and residents, most of them have never even seen it. Um, I just want everybody to really inform yourself, make sure you're getting your information from legitimate 
sources, not from people who are polit political analysts who have strong opinions, but from people who are scientists, who are um, physicians, and who know and who are seeing this. And when we talk about strain on a healthcare system, I just want to say on behalf of myself and my colleagues and some that I know are within our community, hospitalization rates are only one indication of a strain on the healthcare system. Right now, we are all experiencing serious um, staffing shortages, shortages, I'm sorry, shortages and crises to the point that we're getting weekly emails asking us to come in to work shifts. People are working at half capacity for nurses, and that means when you come into the hospital with a heart attack, a stroke, you broke something, there's less staff to take care of you. So when we talk about this being a public health issue, it is a public health issue, it's a crisis. And I know that just historically when smoking was banned or when people had to wear seat belts, it's always a resistance. And I just want to encourage everybody to really take a step back Ask yourself why you feel the way you do and get information that is accurate and reliable when you're making decisions for you and your family. Um, that's about it for me. Okay, thank you, Teres. Um, for me, so Cynthia Tate is uh, also um, not gonna make it tonight also. She's not gonna make it tonight. Um, she had something personal um, pop up, so she regrets to say she's not gonna be here tonight. Um, so as for me, I just wanted to give a quick update on um, where we are for the summer. I know our last board meeting before the summer started, I had mentioned um, some of the things the board was going to be working on. The two main things were going to be trying to move the, the capital improvement project along and, and also our, our retreat. So on the capital improvement project, I won't get too much into that, but we have met quite a few times with the facilities committee to move that project along and made a lot of good progress. We had some good meetings about um, some of the scope of the projects and drilling down a little, in a little more detail on that. That's all gone very, very well. And, and we also had some uh, facilities meetings on trying to select a construction manager, which is still being uh, worked out, but we're getting close to, 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 to an end on that. So that's all gone very well. And then as far as our retreat, uh, we haven't had it yet, but we are having it a week from tomorrow, so a week from Tuesday. The 31st is going to be our board retreat, which is very late this year, but it just was difficult with uh, different schedules to get all that done. Um, and of course, it's been a busy summer behind the scenes with COVID-related stuff and, and getting ready for the opening of school and trying to navigate all the different um, trends and things that are happening. But I won't get into that right now. I know the superintendent has a presentation on that, so I'll wait, I'll wait till that. So that's pretty much all I have excited for the new school year. Um, Probably won't be as normal to start out with as we'd hope it, it would be, but I think we're, we're still in a much better place than we were last year. So I'm still optimistic about how the year is going to be. So that's pretty much all I got uh, as far as comments. Next comments by the superintendent. I just want to just want to say that the, for the people in the back, there are seats up here if you'd like to come sit down. Good evening. I am pleased to have this opportunity to present to the Board of Education and the Tuckahoe School community about the summer session and our plans for the year ahead. A special thank you to our administrative team who have worked tirelessly throughout the summer, to our union leadership who worked with us and partnered and collaborated, and to the community for their patience, understanding, and flexibility. Tuckahoe continues to lead the way, and you will see in tonight's presentation, we have no plans to stop. First, we will look back to the very busy summer months. While our students and families vacation, our buildings are very much open and bustling with activity. We are hard at work preparing for a successful school year ahead. Our maintenance staff has been incredible. They had to disassemble all we had put in place last year and get it ready seemingly overnight for our summer program. 
We hosted two outside programs plus our own summer school program. And now our facility staff have to put the entire district back in place for a more typical school year. If last summer was a story of transforming schools for COVID, this summer is a story of transforming schools back for learning. We hosted two summer support programs to provide extra support due to COVID-19. One focused on students in grades nine through 12 to support credit recovery, and another for students in grade K to eight to help address learning loss and keep students engaged over the summer. Our in-person extended school year program was a huge success thanks to the dedication of our teaching and power professional staff. They crafted an enriching and stimulating program for our learners. We welcome Dr. Sweeney and her role as Director of Special Education and Student Services, and we are pleased to see Ms. Sparks assume her role as District Business Official. They have both hit the ground running. Over the summer, teacher have, teachers have engaged in curriculum work around our strategic goals. This has been under the leadership of Mr. Keo. It has been a very busy summer, and this is just a sampling of the work that has been undertaken to help advance our bold and progressive strategic plan. Elementary teachers engaged in training and preparation for Science 21, an engaging phenomenon-based science curriculum in which students own inquiry and own their own inquiry and construct understanding. Our third grade teachers are joining our foundation's implementation, meaning students will have access to this program, a phonics-based program in grades K to three. Meanwhile, teachers in our special education and English as new language department work towards certification in Wilson reading, ensuring they can provide research-based intervention to readers in need of supports. Speaking of interventions, there's been a lot of work in the area of response to intervention or RTI. Our administrators attended training on iReady and have developed an implementation plan for focused benchmark assessments and dedicated time for teacher inquiry and analysis. This will allow us to better target our interventions. Additionally, iReady provides instructional models for support. While this will enhance our intervention, it is not a supplement. Our teachers make use of numerous research-based strategies, and our goal for the upcoming year and beyond is to continue adding to the toolbox. Now looking ahead to the 2021-2022 school year and the ways in which our reopening guidelines, with which you became from very familiar with last year, have been modified. Different stakeholders played a role in the development of these plans as well as policymakers and local health experts. We believe the plan we present this evening, which are flexible and may change based on data, puts our children's safety and learning at the center. This is something all stakeholders can agree on. Income, incoming governor, as of I think 12 a.m. tonight, Kathy Hochul has communicated her intention to impose a mask mandate like neighboring states have done. The plans we present tonight anticipates these forthcoming changes to regulations. Additionally, there is no denying the pervasiveness of the contagious Delta variant. Unvaccinated individuals in particular represent almost 90% of hospital admissions for COVID-19, and the majority of our students are currently unvaccinated. Our community is strong, and although there are conflicting viewpoints on these matters, we have come together in difficult times. We understand there is uncertainty ahead and we hopefully will pivot to less restrictive guidelines and we remain ready to do that when the time comes. Children look for us for examples. If we are worried, concerned, anxious, or angry, we unsettle them and impact their return to school. And last year we did a great job with all of our mitigation efforts. We have seen these situations also continually improve. This September looks much better than last, which looks much better than the previous March. Let's focus on the positive and move forward together. Another improvement over the year past is access to data. Westchester County has a dashboard which allows us to monitor positivity rates. In the chart, 
on the right or on the left, in front or wherever you're sitting, you can see the curves we worked so diligently to flatten. Unfortunately, you see as we move to the current data, a visible uptick. Currently, Westchester County has 4.1 positivity rate. As of today, all of Westchester are considered substantial and high spread areas. There are a number of active cases in our community, and you know we're part of Bronxville, Eastchester, and Tuckahoe. So Tuckahoe has 11 active cases, and Bronxville just below it has 10. On the right, the ver very more populous New Rochelle has 259 active cases. Meanwhile, the town of Eastchester, which houses our school facilities, has 59 active cases. This is as of Friday. Additionally, we are monitoring vaccination rates in local zip codes. In districts that have already opened throughout the country, there has been a correlation between the vaccination rate of larger communities and the number of required quarantines. Percentages of fully vaccinated individuals in the three zip codes or a district pulls from an average of 65.3%. Uh, with, with our zip code in which our district is located, we have a 65.4% vaccination rate. Communities such as Ardsley and Largemont have roughly 80%, where nearby Mount Vernon has 41.2% of that population fully vaccinated. School districts in Ardsley and Largemont may be able to stop with the mask mandate sooner than we will. I heard um, recently that wearing a mask and some of these mitigation strategies change as the vaccination rate goes up. I believe our community is on the way. Now we look to the survey data. As you know, we administered a survey early in the summer as a means of understanding the sentiment of our community. Due to our district's obligation to public health and student safety and following mandates, survey data cannot be deter a determining factor in our decision making. When we were asked about whether or not to mask, if it was an individual or family decision, a majority of respondents, 67% disagreed. 67% of survey respondents believe decisions about masks should, cannot, should not be made by the family, but can be made by the school district or whatever other entity there is. Additional information has helped us to guide our reopening plan. This includes 61% of respondents believe that our district should serve as a vaccination site for families consenting to student vaccinations. As a result, we will continue to partner with our county health department if they are offering vaccine access to community members and for students whose families want that. 84% of our respondents believed our district should play a role in communicating information about vaccines and other mitigation strategies. As a result, we will continue to inform the community about de developments and information in our region's fight against COVID-19, including vaccines and other information. 94% of, of our community is united in the fact that the district's priority should be to return to full-time instruction in-person instruction for the 21-22 school year. While not surprising in a community such as ours, a community that's focused on education and academic excellence, we were pleased that that statistic represented our community's shared priority. The plan we present places returning to full-time in-person and keeping students in the classroom and quarantining very little as our driving priority. It is important to recognize our role in this global pandemic is to ensure students are safe and to ensure they are learning. I mean, we must rely on the expertise of more than 70,000 doctors and scientists that comprise the American Academy of Pediatrics and all the other health institutions, just as they rely on education, educators for their, for their academic knowledge. Some of the other changes this year are free breakfast and lunch, actually we did that last year for all students. There'll be a modified block schedule for the middle school, high school. We added an access in case we have to quarantine to a quarantine teacher at the elementary school with some of our federal money, because we found that when students were quarantined, it was difficult for our young ones to zoom into classrooms, and we hope we don't have to use that much. And we added tutoring and after school help. 
I know that our community is divided on many of these issues. The survey data we presented does not speak to unanimity. We also had um, people in our district, the majority, favored masks for the elementary school, but also the majority favored the op option for the middle school, high school. In transparency, I want to make sure everybody knows that. But we are all united in our desire to keep kids safe and ensure they, en they enjoy school. People have views and feelings, and I respect that. I understand that, and even I have changed my views over time. But it's our professional obligation to place trust in our school physician, our schools, our local experts, and leading medical organizations. We are also required to follow state mandates, and we appreciate all the community's flexibility and understanding. While this announcement is surprising and really doesn't give me pleasure to say this, I thought it was going to be very different in June, but it's, I thought that we were going to perhaps not have masks and we started out summer school without masks. And well, actually, not really. We started it with encouragement of students to mask and, most, and actually all of them did. But within a week or two, we had a breakthrough infection of a staff member. The district, especially because we know what's coming up, will require indoor masking for all individuals, including teachers, staff, and visitors and students, regardless of vaccination status. Meanwhile, outdoor students and staff are not required to wear masks. While using district transportation, masks must be worn by all students and staff at all times on school buses. Now, Next slide. Public health experts say quarantine should be relatively rare as schools are following the latest CDC and AAP guidance. Students who are three to six feet apart will not have to quarantine after coming in contact with an infected individual if they are masked indoors. While contact tracing requires quarantining all unvaccinated individuals and infected persons interacting will have to quarantine if they're not wearing masks. Quarantine rules do not reply to students who are consistently wearing masks. So we will be three feet or more apart in the classroom, and we will be six feet apart at lunch. So as a result, we really don't expect to have, quarantine should really be rare as we follow these rules. Exposed individuals are to test three to five days post-exposure. That's the recommendation from the CDTC. Again, there's no quarantine requirement if students are three feet, up, three feet to six feet apart with masks and unmasks more than six feet. That's a big change. So as I mentioned, we will do our best to spread staff and students out as much as possible within the classroom. We strive to maintain three feet of social distancing, six feet for lunch, and the layered mi mitigation strategies that I said before, and we expect in-person learning to be the mainstay this school year. The next slide. Remote learning. We are now able to house all students on campus. The district is no longer offering remote learning as an option for students. The New York State Education Department has made it clear, so long as allowed by public health officials, schools should be open for in-person teaching and learning, and students should be in school. Parents or guardians still have the option to homeschool their children, and I don't think that many, I haven't gotten any interest in that, but it is through the Office of Curriculum Instruction. Of course, if children are sick, um, there's always homeschooling if students are severely ill for any reason. I mean, home instruction, that's different. And communication, that's also part of our plan. The district remains committed to communicate to students, parents, and staff, and visitors. The plan will be updated throughout the school year to respond to the circumstances as they change. The district, I think, last year developed a very good plan to communicate. We added robocalls. We were very um, upfront with our school community. The Blackboard Connects people um, responded to and presentations at the Board of Education. I'm really trying our best, and we are trying our best, to be very transparent with our community. And now, for something positive, 
is an exciting development. We are able to offer the, the universal pre-K at our school district. If I can just explain for a second how this happened. So as part of the federal monies that came to school districts, we've gotten, every district got money per pupil to do full time, which is five hours of preschool. Many districts did not feel that was enough money to get a community partner to uh, partner with them. But um, thanks to Faith over here and, our, and my administ other administrators, Mr. Keogh, we partnered together and we, Faith Sparks, our new, um, our new business manager, we made sure that we got the word out. We were gonna do it no matter whichever way we could. Um, Tuckahoe got fewer dollars than all other districts, unfortunately, and we will fight and advocate for more money as the year goes on. The reason I was told we got less money was because we had a program before, but that's really unfair. So we will do some advocating. I um, advocated recently. I think it should be for every single. Universal means everybody. Everybody should have preschool. Preschool is very expensive, and we know that preschool works for children. It makes a difference. And even for a middle class family, it's very hard to afford it. And the more kids you have, the more difficult it is. So we are going to um, have an advocacy committee this year, and I think that's one of those things we should really tackle for Tuckahoe. Um, we have, it is, and if you go on our website, it will explain to you how this is done. Um, please share this with families that may not have any children in our school yet. It is for four-year-olds. Four it is full-time, which is five days. Somebody asked me um, today if there was before and after school care. There will be, but that will be for a cost to families. And it's right in the village of Tuckahoe. So we're very excited about that. Um, the lottery information will be, so we, it already started today. You could bring your application right to Cottle between 7.30 and 2.30, and there's a drop box or you can email it, and the email is on the website. Again, the last day to register is September 3rd, 2021, and there's information about the lottery. It will be totally random. It's a computer system that will press a button, and um, that's how um, people will be chosen. Looking ahead, our community is united in continuing to rethink how our schools keep evolving this is evidenced in our respectful discussions and debate, our focus on student safety, and our bold progressive strategic plan. As a leader of this district, one positive thing I see emerging from this pandemic is the application of grace and, and humanity in our school. People have called me, they've spoken to me, I understand there are different views. Nobody has gotten angry. And we haven't seen that in our district, and we are not going to see that in our district because we are a civil district that cares about each other. I understand that people's viewpoints are different. My viewpoint continues to evolve. I admit that. So I encourage everyone to enter this year as we did last year. Ultimately, we look forward to a re very rewarding school year. Join us as we continue to lead the way. Thank you. Universal Pre-K is, I'm so excited about that. Very, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Very good presentation, thank you. All right, so just to clarify um, before we move on, in terms of the mask mandates, um, so my understanding, I just wanna make sure everybody understands as well, it was a, a, um, a waiver or a moratorium allowed for masks to be lifted in the summer. But that's now over. Right. And my understanding is the, is the current mandate from the, from the State Department of Health is that mask mandates are in place in schools until September 20th. Yes, there is a regulation that our attorney, which we skipped over that part, that our attorney explained to us that although Governor Cuomo lifted emergency regulations. This was a different kind of regulation. 
that masks are in place anyway until right. September 20th. Again, we have a new governor starting 12 a.m. today or, to, or tomorrow, I guess. And um, the expectation is it will continue, but that's why I can say that it's mandated at least till September 20th, but I believe it will continue yeah. that mandate. And again, things can change. Let's let's look positively and hope that they do. I do. I, I'm optimistic. It's much better than it was in March, and much better than it was last year yeah. when we started school. So in terms of how this thing evolved, the last board meeting we had, we we had a discussion and then agreed to advocate for lifting of mandates. After that, the Delta variant surged. Then there was some discussion for a little while, like as if it was still going to be left up to the, to the districts to decide. And then now the pendulum swung the other way. Right. So now we know we have this mandate already in place until the 20th. And every expectation that you have based on your conversations with the state is that the mandate will continue beyond the 20th. Right. So it's likely not going to be this board's decision um, for some time on uh, what we do at masks. Right. But I was on the phone with the New York State Department of Health today in a call. And, um, you know, it's everything's certainly going to, but until it is, um, but there's a certainty that it will be mandated by the new government. Okay. So the other thing just um, you mentioned was the quarantine, which is great as far as that's a big difference because that was very um, disruptive. That is such a great difference yeah. that yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very thrilled. First of all, I'm thrilled that the principals and myself do not have to be up all night, hopefully, and I'm thrilled that the kid, you know, trying to contact trace that our students will be in school. You know, it won't be this crazy um, year that we had last year. And I think we did a great job that we didn't close down our schools much at all, but it still was extremely disruptive to children's learning and to families and working parents and even, and even if you're home with your kids, it's disruptive. So we love our kids, but we want them in school. Now, tying the mask mandate to no quarantining needed is a huge step. Huge. And then once we make the lunch, six feet or more apart, oh, well, I don't want to surprise the high school kids with anything else, but um, we're going to, I, I believe, you know, that we're going to, um, juniors aren't allowed out for lunch until like April, and we'll definitely move that up for our juniors because we need room in the lunchroom and we trust that they'll be able to do that. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Actually, we're going to make a change to the order of the um, agenda because we have quite a bit of um, personnel um, movements to make. And, and I know uh, Mr. Moresh wants to make a few comments about some of the folks that are on tonight's agenda for personnel recommendations. So I'm going to jump over to uh, G. Oh, I skipped over you, Faith. That's okay. Look at that. Um, I I'm just sorry about quick, that. Something quick. So, I um, apologize. Go ahead. Like you mentioned before, we are very close to reaching an agreement for a construction management firm. So that will be happening quickly. Um, and also our audit field work concluded last week, and it went very well. So um, the board will be accepting the audit report in October, and we'll review it with the audit committee before then sometime in September. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, it's OK. <laughs> All right, so we're going to jump over to G, um, yeah, G, which is uh, personal recommendations. And I'm going to actually, before we vote on it, because it's a, it's a grouped together uh, agenda item, I was going to give Mr. Moresh uh, an opportunity to speak about some of the uh, appointments that are being made. Thank you, Mr. Kasson, and uh, good evening, everyone. So it's my honor to be here to introduce some of our new teachers, uh, t you know, probationary track teachers, to the William E. Kyle School and the Tuckahoe Union Free School District this evening. We're going to start with Ms. Nicole Mundell. Nicole Mundell is, a certi is certified in childhood education. She has experience teaching in general education in public schools in the Bronx for the last three years. In addition, she has experience teaching departmentalized ELA in fifth grade and also has experience teaching in an IST, ICT, excuse me, classroom setting in both fourth and fifth grade. Her bachelor's and master's degrees are both completed at Mercy College in Dobbs Ferry 
And Nicole Mundell has uh, went beyond impressed us in every round of the interview process. Uh, her demo lesson involved hands-on learning as well as peer collaboration. This instruction lends itself beautifully to what we are looking to accomplish with our STEAM program. Nicole has already hit the ground running by completing three and a half days of professional development. Am I right? Three and a half days already of professional development with creative learning systems coaches. And she already has the innovation lab up and running. So we are very fortunate and excited that Nicole has joined our Cottle family. Or will be joining our Coddle family. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Ms. Maritza. Marissa Watson is, a, is certified as a school counselor in grades K through 12. She has been the school counselor at an elementary K through 8 school in the Bronx for the last two years. She has experience in both individual and group counseling and has worked with teachers and parents to develop and implement strategies for students with social, emotional, and academic needs. Her master's degree in school counseling was completed at Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut. And Marissa also hit the ground running, diving right into the Rethink program and curriculum. Marissa has already taken part in team meetings with myself, and this week she will already be connecting with students and families at Cottle. So likewise, we are truly fortunate and excited that Marissa will be joining us in the Cottle family. And finally, we have Ms. Marcella DiCarlo, uh, has New York State certification in childhood education, grades one through six, and has a master's degree in elementary education with a reading concentration. She has been teaching third grade in public schools in Stanford, Connecticut for the last seven years. Her bachelor's and master's degrees are both completed at Sacred Heart University. And similarly, Marcella made an instant positive impression through the interview process. We look forward to Marcella coming on board as a full-time interventionist. As an AIS interventionist, she will work with students in Tier 2 and, in, and Tier 3 in small group and individual reading and math instruction. In addition, she will collaborate with the classroom teachers on Tier 1 interventions. We congratulate Marcella, and we welcome her very soon, shortly, to the Kyle family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marish. And congratulations to each of you, although we haven't voted yet, but we will. Um, well, welcome. We're excited to have all of you. Thank you. So let's make that official. Um, so that is resolved that the Board of Education of Tuckahoe Union Free School District approves personal action items A through BB as outlined below. Do I have a motion? Lori. Second, Laura. Any discussion? All in favor? With us the rest? All right, good. Okay. <laughs> A little delay? Okay. All right. So congratulations to all of you. All right. So then we're going to jump back over to our consent agenda. Oh, no. Actually, our first recognition of the audience. Um, so, sorry? Oh. Congratulations to the staff if you want to go. Or if you'd love, like to stay, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, up to you. So this is, brings us to our first recognition of the audience for agenda items only. Um, I just wanted to take a, a moment to, this is sort of our first meeting of the new school year, although technically the last meeting was the first meeting of the new school year, uh, which was the reorg meeting. <clears throat> but this is kind of our first regular meeting. And I wanted to reiterate uh, our policy on uh, public comments, both uh, whether it be um, you know, on the first end, which is on the, uh, the recognition of the audience for agenda items, or even on the back end when we do the comments for, for any. If anyone wants to read the policy, I'm not going to recite it. It's policy number 1230 in, in board docs. But essentially, um, what it, you know, obviously it talks about decorum and, and being professional and all of that. We've never really had an issue with that here. Um, but the one item that I don't typically enforce, I mentioned last year I was going to enforce it and that I didn't do a very good job enforcing it, it was, is the three-minute rule. Um, the three-minute rule in terms of comments. And, and, you know, me not enforcing it entirely last year was not done unconsciously. Um, I just, you know, don't like cutting anybody off. I, I, we, we, as a board, value everyone's input and everyone's comments. 
Um, and typically, we don't get a lot of speakers. Typically, on a, on a given board meeting, we'll have two or three speakers, maybe. So, you know, I just don't see the point. I didn't see the point in that situation of, of cutting anybody short. But I do recognize um, that that's a little bit dangerous for me to do because I'm setting a bad precedent. And then when it comes time to have to enforce that policy, when we have a lot of speakers and a, and a big issue, then I, I'm kind of stepping on my own toes a little bit. So, so with the new school year, I am going to stick to it this year, 100% for sure. Robin's going to keep me on, honest. She's going to be my timekeeper. Um, and we are going to adhere to it this year. Again, you know, my, my objective is to run a, a clean, professional, well-moving board meeting. It's not meant to cut anybody sh uh, short <clears throat> or stifle anybody. It's just meant to keep things moving along and be courteous to the other folks that want to speak. We have a pretty large audience tonight. I'm guessing we're gonna, probably going to have a bunch of speakers, and that's great. But we are going to stick to that three minutes. And the other thing, too, I wanted to clarify, just so people understand, you know, we've done it in the past and we, and we shouldn't. When you speak at the podium for a comment section, it's not meant to be a back and forth. It's not a debate. It's not a, a trial. It's not a, a, a discussion, quite frankly. It's, it's your opportunity for three minutes to speak to the board. Um, so I'm going to ask my fellow board members and myself to refrain from a back and forth discussion. That's not the pr purpose of this time period. Um, so really, uh, it's just about your comments. What I will do, though, is at the end of the comment period, when everyone's done making their comments, I will give each board member an opportunity to make a follow-on comment to whatever was said if they want to. Um, so we'll, 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 if somebody wants to respond or say something in, re in reaction to what someone said during a comment period, that's fine, but it's going to be after that person's left the podium and it's just a statement. So it's not going to be a back and forth. I think that's important to, to keep that decor in, in, in line as well. So with that being said, Anybody for first recognition of the audience or any agenda items only? Go ahead, ma'am. Hi. My name is Deborah Vasquez. I've been here before. <clears throat> I didn't really prepare much of a speech. This is kind of like what I just wrote down in the last hour. There's a, a few things that Amy had touched on that I kind of jotted down. Um, <clears throat> but I did write a few things that were already addressed. So I'm going to skip those parts on my notes. Let me just start by saying um, I've come to meetings here. This is my third meeting. I didn't see a lot of parents sitting in this crowd saying that they wanted their children to wear masks. The only people that were sitting here were people who did not want masks. We came here. We gave statistics. We, we had studies. We had people coming here reading studies, medical literature. Nothing was taken into consideration. The two members on the board that are here, which was Mrs. Therese Gardier and Lori, suggested that masks should be worn. They did not bring a study. They did not bring not one medical journal, not, not one medical literature, but they want masks on our children. If you're going to come to the board, and you're going to say you want masks on our children? I want proof that the masks are effective against COVID-19. I looked for 18 months. There's not one out there. Not one. And not one person that sat here and said they wanted our children to wear these masks came here and proved to us parents that these are scientifically working against COVID-19. And yet our children are still wearing them. People have access to medical literature. Bring it in. I want to see it. I want to read it. A study, something, we got nothing. We hear hearsay, uh, what people think, what they feel. And to me, if people are coming up here with, with actual facts and studies, we deserve, the, the, we deserve that. We deserve to put our children in masks and have some sort of proof that they actually work. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we talked about mental health in one of these meetings. I don't think anybody decided to ask these children if they want to wear these masks. Where are their surveys? Where are their questionnaires? I guarantee you, if you ask these children, they don't want to wear masks. They're not happy. Not one, not one child I know wants to wear a mask. They don't even want to go to an after-school party if there's a mask involved, even for their friends. So I'm just going to say that. Um, <clears throat> I'm disappointed as a parent that I came here asking for a remote option. I came here in June, before July, and I had asked to let us know by July 1st, which was the cutoff date for homeschooling. I didn't get an email until after July. I was away. I couldn't do anything. Couldn't get any paperwork. I was out of state. 
So um, there aren't a lot of parents, and I, from what you said on your questionnaire, that pretty much they, everybody wants, 96% want in-person instruction. Well, for the small percent of adjusts that do want in remote, I don't understand why that's such a, that's so difficult. I would like to know, what did the teachers, what were their answers on the questionnaires? Were they given questionnaires? How many teachers said, well, maybe we should have remote? Yes? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matthews. Anyone else for agenda items? Appreciate your comments, but that really wasn't for agenda items. Um, anybody have anything for agenda items? No? But Ms. Um, I mean, I would, you could sit on an agenda item. I would, I would, if it's going to be, I, I would say let's leave that to the end, if you don't mind, Ms. Allen, because, because uh, I just think that's more of generic type stuff. Um, this, this portion is really more for the actual items on, on the agenda itself, not really presentations, um, so that we can get through the agenda and then we can have time for, for more generic comments. Go ahead. Yep. No, no. Yeah, let's, let's leave that to the end, if that's okay. Ms. Miller, you have anything from the PTA? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Again, if there's anyone who wants to sit down, if you're tired or standing, there are seats available in the front. Good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm Susan Mealy. I'm the PTA president. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I want to start by making sure everybody knows that our Board of Ed trustees are volunteers. Um, they give up a lot of time to do what they do for, in terms of leading our district. And I just want to welcome you back to the new school year and thank you for your role and all the time that you donate here. Um, congratulations, Dr. Goodman, and thank you on getting universal pre-K. Uh, people have been very, very, very excited about that. It's something the community has been clamoring for for years, and that's really great news. Um, I've been a little distracted lately, as you know, but I am available to help with advocacy efforts on behalf of the PTA, um, so please call on me as needed. Um, we, as the PTA, have a lot planned already for the coming school year. Even though we're, it's still August, we're working ahead. Um, and so just to give the community a rough idea, some of the things that we already have on the calendar after meeting with Mr. Marash, we have some welcoming back to school um, initiatives. We have a Halloween hullabaloo for coddle kids that we're planning. We have uh, the fall book fair, the holiday boutiques, the sale of spirit wear, school picture day. Um, and just all kinds of other things coming down the pike. So those are just the few things that we had to grab on the calendar right away and um, just want to put that out there. Um, all of our programs, we try to keep a lean budget, but we do rely on membership dues and our fundraising efforts to pay for these programs. So please stay tuned for our solicitation of your support. It means a lot. It helps keep us going. Um, the only source of support that we get comes from those two efforts. We don't get grants or anything like that. Um, but I do want to give a heads up that the principals have been kind enough to include PTA membership forms in the parent packet that has gone out. And I discovered today that that link is not working. So we have to investigate that. Um, if you're having trouble paying your dues online, we will follow up and try to fix that. Um, I think it's part of an end of year turnover thing with the company that we use for that service. Um, and I will comment on, uh, I'll come back up for the other comment, but just wanted to give those remarks for now. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ms. Miller. All right. So that brings us to our consent agenda. Resolved to approve consent agenda items 2 through 16. Do I have a motion? Laura? Second? Lori? Any discussion? Any comments about the consent agenda? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I keep switching back and forth between the, um, the live stream to hear the comments. All right. Next item is business of the board. Item one, adopt the safety plan. Resolve that the Board of Education of the Tuckahoe Union Free School District hereby adopts the building level safety plans for William E. Cottle School, Tuckahoe Middle 
school and Tuckahoe High School as well as the district safety plan for the 2021 and 2022 school year. Do I have a motion? Lori, second Laura. Any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Except the donation. <clears throat> Whereas Dieter J. Rolfink, a 1959 graduate of Tuckahoe High School, seeks to establish a scholarship for a senior of Tuckahoe High School in honor of his deceased wife, Jackie Grill Rolfink, and George Bailey, who were both 1957 graduates of the Tuckahoe Union Free School District. And whereas Jackie Grill assisted George Bailey in his campaign for president of Tuckahoe High School Student Council, and whereas George Bailey was the first African-American to be elected president of the Tuckahoe High School Student Council, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Tuckahoe Union Free School District hereby accepts a donation of $10,000 from Dieter Rolfink, a 1959 graduate of Tuckahoe High School, subject to the condition that the donation be used exclusively to establish annual scholarship to be named THS Scholarship in honor of Jackie Grill and George Bailey, THS Class of 1957, and be it further resolved that the scholarship be awarded to the first time, for the first time in the year 2022 and each and every school year thereafter, as long as the scholarship fund contains sufficient monies to a male or female senior with financial need who has been accepted into and plans to attend an accredited four-year college or university or two-year community college following high school graduation who has a minimum cumulative average of 80% through January of, of the student's senior year, and who has demonstrated some commitment to improving our society at the local, state, or national level, and be it resolved that the scholarship recipient sh shall be selected by the Tuckahoe High School Scholarship Committee, and be it further resolved that the scholarship awarded each year shall be in the amount of $1,000, and be it further resolved that the donation shall be held in a separate scholarship account by the district and that the district shall have the, the discretion to invest the principal of the fund in a prudent and reasonable manner in accordance with the Board of Education Investment Policy, Policy 6240, and accompanying regulation 6240-R, and be it resolved that the, the district may accept additional contributions from time to time to the scholarship fund for the THS scholarship in honor of Jackie Grill and George Bailey, THS class of 1957. And be it further resolved that if the monies held in the scholarship fund shall be less than $1,000 for three consecutive years, the scholarship fund account shall be closed and the monies held in the scholarship account shall be transferred to the high school student activity fund for the general organization scholarship using the same criteria. Do I have a motion? Lori. Second, Laura. Any discussion? This is actually a really great story. Do you want to expand on this story? Yes, it's really a, kind a of little cool. bit. So, um, that was a long resolution yeah, that really said most of what I could say. Um, so Dieter Rolfing, who, who graduated from Tuckahoe High School in 1959, and his wife, Jackie Grill, who he lost to pancreatic cancer three years ago. In 1956, George Bailey, who's African American, decided to run for president of the Tuckahoe High School government, which then was called the Student Council. Jackie Grill looked over all the candidates and became convinced that George was by far the best candidate. As a result, she offered to run his campaign. She persisted in her belief that George could do it, and he did, and he became the first African American to be elected to president of Tuckahoe High School, and he wanted to give something back um, in her name and also in George Bailey's name. So we are extremely grateful for the scholarship to Mr. Wolfink. It's a great memory of his wife and the first African American president of our student council. It's a most generous donation to our district and to our students. So thank you. Yeah, really great. Nice. All in favor? Address. I'm sure she's in favor. Okay. And next is approval MOA. Resolve the Board of Education of Tuckahoe Union Free School District hereby approves the MOA dated uh, August 23, 2021, by and between the District of the Tuck of Tuckahoe Teachers Association and authorizes the superintendent to execute the same. Do we have a motion? Laura. Second? Laura. Any discussion? I actually did want to get a little more clarification about this. I did read it. Um, I wasn't quite understanding what the purpose of the change was. I know it had to do with uh, some time before and after school. Can you explain a little more yes. what, what the purpose so, of that MOA was? So we're going to go back to 
the schedule in the middle school, high school modified a little bit as it was last year. And to do um, this type of scheduling, which is block scheduling, like we did last year, it will cause teachers, some teachers, to work seven periods, and they're only supposed to work five periods. So in exchange for that, some days where they have extra time in the beginning or the end of the day, it was a, um, it's only for this school year, and hopefully, um, if we go to block scheduling, and we come up with something different, but it was a last minute thing as we realized that, you know, Delta variant, and we knew it was a success last year, and we didn't have to uh, quarantine that many kids. And so we went back to that. It's the same um, um, MOA we had last year. Right, last okay. So, so again, it's to accommodate yeah. the block scheduling that you may want right. to do. Okay. okay, got it. All in favor? Number four, approve people. Oh, can I say one more thing? Yes. And since we don't use lockers during this, we found it very successful. We want we don't want kids to carry heavy bags to you know eight classes a day. So that was the other reason. All right. P approve pupil per uh, personnel agreements. Resolve to approve the pupil personnel agreements A through K below for the 2021-2022 school year. Oh, Venus A through K, Rob. Do I have to read them all? Very good, very good. Do I have a motion? Laura, second. Lori, any discussion? All in favor? All right, that brings us to the personnel recommendations, which we already did. So that's pretty quick. That brings us to the end of the meeting, I believe. Let me just check. Right, so now that brings us to our second recognition to the audience for any item at all. Who's first? He, uh, the, um, should I address the comment made from before? Is this the time to do that? I, you know, I, with all due respect, I think that probably should have been done now. So I would okay. think let's let's let all the comments be done and then let's okay. let's make our whatever comments we want to make follow on. I would just group that comment into what comments are going to be made now. Sounds good. Yeah. Hi, Allison Heller, um, 115 Middleton Place. I just had a couple of questions or comments about the um, fantastic presentation that Dr. Goodman gave us regarding school opening. Um, my first is that I just want to express, to, well, thank you, first of all, for all the effort that you went through. Second, um, I'm a little bit disappointed, a lot disappointed, that we have to do block scheduling again for middle school and high school. It was really difficult for the children and I believe the staff to um, do block scheduling. It is so hard, in particular with science, to sit through a block schedule of a lab and then a block schedule of the science class. It is so long and so hard for the kids. Um, and I also felt like the majority of the time, only half the period was being used anyway, and then the kids were doing homework or they were left to, to their own devices. It wasn't the full hour and a half was not truly being utilized in learning. And so were we really making up the five days worth of instruction time that we would have had we had a regular schedule? In addition to that, now that we don't have to quarantine because we're doing the masks, or not so much, I really don't see why we have to do the block scheduling because we did that so that there would be less contact tracing. But if we're wearing a mask and we don't have to do the contact tracing in that manner, why do we still have to do the block scheduling? Just if we could please reconsider that. I think that is the thing that really needs to go away from middle school and high school. It just did not work last year at all. Um, my second question or comment is um, there was a slide there where it talked about kids who would have to quarantine, um, even though it's a small number. And I understand if we wear a mask that we don't if we're three feet apart. But what about when kids are playing sports and we're not wearing a mask, um, you know, for outdoor sports? Um, and what will the difference be between vaccinated and unvaccinated students? Um, I think that's really important when we do a broader um, explanation of the return to school, how that's going to affect each student, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated. Um, and my last thing is for a student that does have to quarantine, if we and, and let's say they have to do the 10 days. If we're not doing remote learning, how are we getting instruction to that child? 10 days, even seven days of missing school is a very long time. 
So how are we going to make sure that that child is getting the instruction that they need in order to be successful? But thank you for your presentation. We're all disappointed that we are still in this situation. It is not where we want to be. I know my children were really hoping to not have to wear masks. But it is important that we are just in school getting as much education as we can and the kids are able to play their sports, interact with their peers as much as they can. I just wish that it wasn't the way that it is, but completely understand why it is. Thank you. I, I don't, I, I, I'm not gonna interact with every single person who comes up here, but I do know some of the answers, so I guess. You I, know, if you as a superintendent, if you have an answer to a question, <laughs> just answer, answer the question. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so first of all, the block scheduling, um, Mr. Keogh and Mr. Um, Dr. Linehan are working on a modified block schedule. It's going to be a little different next year, and teachers are training in project-based learning. That is our goal. We'd, we'd love to be able, and we are working on a whole group of teachers who are trained um, this summer and last year on that. So that's what we want to use it more as an inquiry-based classroom. Um, that is where we're going as a school district, so we're going to be looking at projects more in that, in that setting. Secondly, wait, I'm trying to get them all. Sports, I know lots of you must be interested in that. I can't answer that question today. I've heard all kinds of things about sports. Um, we are starting like we started last year, and we're, you know, there's no masks outside, there's masks inside. That's what we're under right now. Um, there is out there, as you saw in New York City, in private schools, you know, mandates for kids to be vaccinated. Um, I don't know if that will happen here. Um, it, I think if anything happened, it might be vaccinated and testing, but or testing. Um, so I'm not sure. But I can't even answer the sports question because I'm very confused. And unfortunately, you know, we start we started sports today, so we just started it as we started it, because if they're outside, kids don't have to quarantine, right? And we're keeping them separated inside the best that we can during practices. Um, secondly, if kids are vaccinated and not symptomatic, asymptomatic, they do not have to quarantine and adults. That's still the truth, not the truth. That's, the, that's, the, that's CDC. I, don't know, I believe that that will continue as the three feet, um, mass three to six feet. If you are asymptomatic and uh, contact, you won't have to quarantine unless you are symptomatic, then you do. So that will help some kids who are playing sports. Um, the kids who are quarantined for COVID and are well can still stream into the classroom. We believe the middle school and high school kids did not have as much of a hard time with it as the elementary kids did. Um, depending upon how we can, hopefully we won't have a lot, how we accommodate the elementary children. We did hire a quarantine teacher with some of our money that we got from the federal government so that they don't have to, you know, I think it was just hard for all the kids to um, stream in. So we'll try to use the quarantine teacher as much as we can. So, and the, and the way that, but, but that I, would be used is, is the quarantine teacher we would go direct re right. di remotely with that and with yes. that child. Yes, so it'll be a smaller group, and if there's not a lot of kids, it'll be very individualized. Also, with this new interventionist, I don't think she's still here, she could help kids also catch up on learning loss. But the middle school, high school kids were streaming in a lot last year. Um, they're, they're much more used to it and able, so we're going to, that, that part will be something we will do, and hopefully we won't have a lot of that. I'm really hopeful with the new um, quarantining that we won't, but you know, I don't know what's gonna happen outside of school and who's gonna get sick and who's gonna be a contact. That could be a whole nother bowl of wax. So. Stay you know, tuned for sports. Anyone else? Um, can I just ask one question? I can't tell if I'm interrupting or not, but um, Dr. Goodman, are we under, are the schools under different quarantine rules than like the Department of Health? The schools are under right now, they're, they're adopting the CDC guidelines. That's what we were told. We were at a meeting with the DOH, that's how, the Westchester Department of Health, that that's how they're doing the quarantine. 
For they schools, have, not for anywhere else. That's right. true. They said K to 12 schools. So I'm not sure how they're doing it. I'll, I guess my question is because it's my understanding if But even if you have a close contact exposure and you're vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine, correct? If you have a close contact and you're vaccinated and you're asymptomatic, you don't have to quarantine. That's true. So middle school, high school kids who are vaccinated have that in addition. True. All right, Ms. I think you're waiting. Go ahead. Yeah. You ready? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so um, I just wanted to also add to the discussion um, on the subject of the COVID mitigation measures. Um, at the July meeting, I f um, well, let me back up. I think, you know, what the way that you guys have led us through this crisis since March of 20 has been exemplary. And I know we, our district has been the envy of our neighboring districts because our district was so proactive, so resourceful, so creative, so transparent, so decisive that we were able to keep school open, keeping kids in school as much as possible. And the community was very united in our support of the district because of the way you handled everything. You were very engaging. We got emails frequently. We, everything was spelled out for us. Our input was sought. There were town hall meetings, et cetera. And there was the health and safety, whatever it's called, advisory committee that guided us through this process. And every step of the way, that was exemplary. And, and then I felt like at the July board meeting, those best practices fell by the wayside. I didn't know that there was this resolution on the agenda. At the time that the meeting notice went out, the agenda wasn't posted. It was July 6th. It was billed as a reorganization meeting, which usually means we're swearing in the same people who were sworn in last year. It's not must-see TV. And many people in the community found out about this topic after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, the Health Advisory Committee, I believe, had not been consulted, and when Therese and Lori recommended tabling the discussion until those measures could be put in place, uh, they were, you know, they were voted down. Um, but they were speaking for me and other people, and I think it's very important that we hear from everybody um, when making big decisions and having big discussions like that, because. I don't even want this discussion at the local level. It's tearing apart a lot of communities. I personally would much rather have the state tell me, here's what we're doing and live in peace. Because having this side versus that side is not really a healthy environment. And um, you know, I, one thing I know is I am not a public health expert and I don't know enough to advocate for anything. And the PTA is based on advocacy. Um, you know, even though the PTA in Tuckahoe is best known for the fun events that we provide, we're really an advocacy organization. But there is a fine line between advocacy and meddling. And I think we're really in danger of crossing that line when it comes to lay people, um, you know, getting very um, aggressive in lobbying for public health measures. Um, so I just want to ask that we Okay, I'm sorry, that we just stay the course that got us to where we've, we are. Um, and, you know, because that has been so fantastic. And uh, you guys know exactly what to do. You've been doing it for 15 months or so. So thank you very much for your service. Good evening, board members and residents. I'm Reverend Dr. Michael Gerald, and I pastor the largest black church in Tuckahoe. And I want to say thank you to the young lady who spoke before me. I said I wasn't going to say anything because anytime 
an African-American minister gets behind a pulpit, <laughs> we tend to hold you for a long time. You only have three minutes. So <laughs> uh, I, too, I echo the comments that preceded me. I was extremely disappointed to learn that after all that we've, we've done to keep our children safe and to keep schools open, that we would risk you know, all of that good work and all that hard effort uh, just to satisfy some who are extremely against masking or vaccine. I'm probably the only one in this audience or watching TV now that has buried as many people as I have during this whole epidemic. It is no joke what this virus does to families and communities and to risk our community to the politicization of vaccine and masking is unthinkable and is unconscionable. And I would just advise each of you who have been elected to serve this citizenry to make sure you are acting on our best interest. There are children who are hospitalized, who are on ventilators, your children, who you don't want to wear masks, they stand the risk of contracting this virus and being hospitalized. And so just as a word of caution and just to encourage us to stay the course, continue to exercise all of our good judgment that has brought us to this point, and hopefully soon and very soon we'll be out of this, this ordeal. But let's make sure we adhere to what the CDC is saying, Department of Health, and our governor. And I'm sure that we will, in due season, be back to normal. So thank you. My name is Lela. Um, I'm a Lela. L A I L A. Lela. I'm a physician. I also have a master's in public health. And today I feel compelled to speak. Um, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Goodman, the principal, and the board for making the decisions last year. And I have to say, after talking to all the moms in the other school districts, our school district was the first one to open schools in person. And I'm so grateful for that. Masks are a nuisance, there's no doubt. But there's no doubt that the Delta variant is disproportionately affecting the kids. There's data everywhere. And masks work. I can give you studies. There's studies out of UK. There's studies out of Germany. There's studies from all many other countries that masks work. If this was a pandemic that only affected the children and didn't affect the adults, we would be appalled. It's just that in comparison with the adults, of course the deaths are less and the hospitalizations are less, of course. But no kid is supposed to die. Children are not supposed to die. Even one death is too many. And death and hospitalizations are not the only things to consider. There's also something called the long COVID in which patients, they have shortness of breath for months after COVID. There have been examples of healthy adults healthy teenagers who have gone to their cardiologist six months after because they cannot compete in athletics anymore. And I can give you examples for that too, from cardiology colleagues across the country. So in addition to deaths, hospitalizations, there are COVID long haulers. In addition to that, if you don't wear masks, there is loss of in-person schooling, there's quarantine, and there's loss of wages. Because who takes care of those children who are sick? For me, in my eyes, a healthy, masked child is better than a sick or a dead one. And I can give you examples of that. This is a very emotional topic for me. And I want to add to Teresa's comments that there are healthcare workers that are leaving the field because of the stress 
and what they're dealing with, both at work and then dealing with everything else at home. I just wanted to strongly urge you, and I am so happy that you know masks are one of the mitigation strategies. It's not the only one. We have to do it collectively like we did last year. Thank you. Anyone else? That's it? OK. All right, so then I'll open, now I'll open up to the uh, board members if they have any follow-on comments, any of the comments that were made. Laura, you want to go first? Yes. Um, since one comment was directed towards me, um, we already tackled the um, actual peer-reviewed uh, literature um, that was already addressed. Um, very easy to look up and see. Um, Therese did a great job of, of putting that to task already. Also, what I feel is that I got vaccinated and had my children vaccinated, um, not because you know I was running trying to get there because I actually had some concerns about vaccination. But I got it done after seeing so many people that I know, love, care about, suffer from the disease. I actually just lost a family member <clears throat> Sunday, Sunday morning from the disease, 45 years old, had no comorbidities, um, and actually caught it from his son. His wife, he and his wife were both hospitalized. He was intubated, and he's now dead. And so I want to leave um, you with this, Ms. Mrs. Vasquez. My concern is, goes beyond myself. I'm here to represent everybody, and that's what I'm going to do. Everybody has rights, not one side or the other. We all do. And I'm here to serve everyone, and that's what I'm doing. And I make no apologies for where I stood on the issue of the uh, referendum or whatever it was, the resolution. I make no apologies for that at all, and I would do it again if I'm, if I'm asked to make that decision again. Our littlest people are five years old to maybe 12, and our sixth graders, some of them are not even vaccine eligible. And so until we have a vaccine that is available to them and the decision, if it is ever left up to this board, I'm going to always vote for a mask. And quite honestly, I wish I didn't have to wear a mask because I got vaccinated. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons I got vaccinated and got my kids vaccinated was so that I didn't have to wear one. So here's what I'm going to leave you with. The reason I wear my mask is for three reasons. One, humility. I don't know if I have COVID, right? As it is clear that people can spread the disease before they have symptoms. Two, kindness. I don't know if the person I'm near has a child battling cancer or cares for their elderly mom. While I might be fine, they may not be. The third reason, community. I want my community to thrive, businesses to stay open, employees to stay healthy. Keeping a lid on COVID helps us all. And I think it's a small price to pay, a small inconvenience to wear a mask until my little sweetie boys and sweetie girls are vaccine eligible and that their parents have had the opportunity to vaccinate them. And that's on the heels of the death of my relative. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Laura? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I, thank you. I, I agree with um, my fellow board members that, you know, this is a very confusing, um, it's a very frustrating time. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, I would go back to the resolution that we discussed was during that time, I think the, the infection rate was something like 0.4. Um, we were in a very different time. And again, I am not, as, as pointed out, I'm not here to do public policy. I'm not 
a healthcare worker that makes public policy. I do, however, do research, and I think that that's my obligation as someone who is representing the community and who does have to, you know, come in front of the camera and, and speak on behalf of, of parents and of the community. Um, I would say that, you know, we, just like the state, it's a constant moving target. Um, if the cases are up, then we readjust, and we had said that very thing, that this was just a, a resolution to give parents a choice if the numbers were so low and the infection rate was so low, to move in that direction, which, you know, I think it's important to give parents the hope and give children the hope that we're moving forward, right? And I think that just, just today talking about not quarantining the kids as much, you know, and moving forward in that direction, I think it's really important. And as a, um, as a board member, <coughs> and speaking on behalf of constituents who want that um, and, and who, who feel that they have um, a right, so to speak, or a responsibility for their parent, for their, sorry, for their <coughs> children, whether it's to vaccinate or not vaccinate or wear a mask or not wear a mask. And again, it goes back to individual choice. So again, we are in, we are in a situation where things have moved since then. And nothing is ever in, you know, when we do resolutions or when we discuss as a board, I, I, I really appreciate everybody that comes out and everybody that gets in front of a microphone, every email, because I'm not here for myself. I'm not here as a representative. And how we do that as a board and as a district is surveys, is having input, is looking at the stats, looking at other districts. It's, it's so many different variables. So I want to thank my fellow board members. And, and specifically, um, you know, Therese does have uh, her hands in studies and has colleagues, and she can bring information to us. But, you know, again, we're not here. We're not here, uh, any of us, to uh, either recommend that, you know, or encourage or, um, you know, sort of um, promote anything. We're here to be as objective as we can, to be as responsible as we can, to be as informed as we can, and even with that, change direction when we need to. And I think that we are a great community. We have so many physicians, nurses, doctors. We have a wonderful pastors and everyone from every walk of life. And the more we keep communicating and the more we show up, and, and, it, and it really should be respectful to both sides. Because if, it, if, it, if somebody doesn't want to go in a direction with their child or they don't want to do something for whatever parental or whatever, uh, they have a discussion with their doctor, we should be very respectful. And we should move forward together in disagreement or in agreement, because you may or may not agree with me. But again, we have to respect each other's um, positions, respect each other's decisions as parents and as community members. So I, I thank everybody for coming <coughs> today, tonight, and I'm sure certainly people home are listening too. So thank everybody for engaging. Thanks, people. Thank you, Laura. Therese, kick it over to you. Can't hear. Can't hear you. Is she should have been line? ready. She knew she was next, right? <laughs> why, why aren't you ready? Well, you I'm know you're next. To, I can't hear Laura. I'm trying to listen on the other thing, and then um, there's like a lag, so I'm behind, and I'm pretty much late for everything anyway. So um, I just want to say that I agree. We definitely need to educate ourselves. We need to be able to pivot, and this is an evolving process. I think that one thing I did want to touch on was the idea of um, that there's herd immunity or that we're at herd immunity. And I think the fact that our hospitalization rates are surging the way that they are is proof that we are not at herd immunity. Um, and I want to reiterate that everybody still, there is a choice because there is no mandate for vaccines. But even back in the beginning of the summer, it was and that you should mask if unvaccinated in public places. And I don't think that that's what happens. So I would just encourage everybody to respect people's choice and to be responsible for your own choices in the way that that impacts other people. There are children in our school who have leukemia and are getting chemotherapy for years, who have other medical issues, who have had heart transplants. And to defy the science, that we know works. I said at the last meeting, and I will say it again, and I will say it at every meeting, that I, or anybody that asked me, that masks do work. Covering your cough reduces the spread of respiratory illness regardless. And we have science that has evolved over decades. We've seen leukemia, which used to have a 100% um, 
mortality, morbidity rate within five years. If you now get leukemia, you're cured 90% of the time or more if it's ALL. And we have to respect that and respect science, even when it doesn't align with our personal beliefs. We also need to make sure that we are um, acting as a community because this is a public school and we are here for everybody and not just for some and not just to promote certain people's beliefs. We want everybody in school. And I think that that's something that we all have agreed on and that should continue to be our focus. And I'm confident that it will be going forward and it always has been. Um, and I just wanna also reiterate that if anybody wants this to end more and not have to wear a mask and not have to do any of this, trust me, I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I forgot the physician who spoke before me, um, but it has been a grueling summer. And not because the hospitalization rates have been so astronomically high, but because as healthcare workers, we're burnt out. In, I work in an ambulatory setting and we're working short. The staff is crying. It is it's unpleasant. It is a really unpleasant and difficult workplace. And I think that we also feel to some degree that you know, where people were supporting their healthcare workers and there were all these signs, the general consensus is that's not the feeling anymore. And I hope that that also turns because it is, it's a lonely place to be right now. I hope that all, everybody um, moves forward into the school year with respect for each other and that some of the venom that has been surfaced kind of dies down because it's not a healthy way to live. Um, I think that's it for me, thank you. All right, thanks, Teres. All right, so for me, I just, uh, a couple of comments. First thing I wanted to um, address was the comments made by Ms. Mealy and, and the Reverend about the, um, the process with the resolution and, and the way that went, that went down. I'm, I'm actually quite proud of it. So I, you and I usually agree on most things, so on this, on this item we'll agree to disagree. Um, I, I actually am proud of how we did that. Um, you know, first of all, the idea that <clears throat> it was put on the agenda late or something like that, that it was put on the agenda at the same time everything's put on the agenda. The agenda's um, always posted a few days before the meeting. Um, this, that resolution was put on at that time. Now, I understand that it was the summertime. It's not always the best time to get community attention, but that was the time to do that resolution if we were gonna do it, because the idea was that Albany was making decisions um, now for, for, Septem for September. Our next board meeting wasn't until now. So I felt, the superintendent felt at the time that there was a timeliness issue to that resolution. Um, and the date of that board meeting was on the calendar for the entire year. There was nothing strategic about how we put that on the agenda. And, you know, at the time, and Laura mentioned it, and I'll just reiterate it, I felt strongly about that, re that, re that resolution because, um, how the numbers were so low and how much of the rest of society was opening up and I felt like our kids were being left behind because they were convenient to be left behind. Um, and at the time, and I know the Delta variant has changed this quite a bit, but before the Delta variant, adolescent and children outcomes from, from COVID were, were infinitesimal. So um, bottom line is, and there's no reason to debate this right now, but my all I want to say is that, you know, I put my time and research into that. I came to that board meeting after putting hours of research in and after thinking through, um, you know, with myself about how I wanted to do this. Um, I take a little bit of offense to the notion that I, I take a lot of offense actually to the notion that I, went, I, I voted on that resolution to satisfy some people that it was political. Um, I put my time and thought into it, and I was thoughtful about it, and I felt strongly about it. You know, I, I understand the notion of following health professionals in a health crisis. I get that. That's pretty obvious, and I understand it. But at the same time, you know, I think we as board members have to look at the whole situation. You know, if you talk to a lawyer about a situation where there's risk, they're always going to tell you not to do it. Right? If you talk to a health professional about something health related, they're going to tell you what's most advantageous for that health situation, and that's important, obviously. But we have to look at the whole child in terms of their entire experience and in terms of the quality of the education that they're getting and try and balance that out. And back in, in, uh, in July, um, when the infection rate was so low and the child negative outcomes were 
basically nothing. Um, it didn't make sense to me. Um, so, you know, again, that seems like eons ago, even though it was only a month and a half ago, but a lot's changed since then. But I defend the process. I think it was the right process, and I was proud of this board by how we had a very civil, professional debate about it, and then we voted. That's the process. The way this is supposed to work is the superintendent puts forth a resolution or a board member puts forth a resolution at the next meeting, which was what happened. It's posted, as it was, and we discuss it and we vote. And that's what we did. So I defend that, and I, and I don't, I, I'm not embarrassed by it at all. I think it was, um, I think it was the right way to do it. Now, a lot's changed since then, and we said that. We, even those that voted for that resolution said that we are voting on it based on where, th where things are now. If things change, things will change, obviously, and we'll, and we'll change along with them. Um, the thing about the Delta variant that's scaring me the most, that's, that's, that's bothering me the most, is that, and the, and the physician men mentioned it before, is that it does appear that there are worser outcomes for, for, younger, for younger folks. It's creeping now into the younger age groups, and that obviously changes the, um, the paradigm, in my mind, for where, we, for where we're at. But I don't, still don't know what the right answer is. Um, I think I was a little clearer to me back in early July when the numbers were as low as they were. It was a little clearer to me about what the right course of action is. With the, with the numbers trending in the other direction, I'm less sure of what should be done. And I'm happy at this point, given the trends that are happening right now, I'm happy that the state is taking over and, it's, and the health officials are taking over now. Um, again, I know it sounds like, con like a contradictory statement, but back in July, um, it, it, it felt like um, we knew where things were going, or at least things were flat um, for a while and very, very low. Now with things trending and that trend continuing, not being sure what's happening to children, um, then I, no, I'm happy that the state is stepping in and taking over on that and taking that decision away from us, quite frankly. Um, but if things settle back down again, I know England, um, the Delta variant kind of ran through there pretty quickly and things flattened out pretty fast for them. Hopefully that'll be the same here. Things flatten back down again, and I feel like our children being left behind again and not being properly, um, you know, the, the, the right risk to reward matrix is, isn't being um, put forth, and then, then I'm happy to advocate again. So um, anyway, I just wanted to, to, to make that comment about, about that process, because I think, I think it, was, it, was, it was a sound process, and again, it wasn't political. Or, or meant to satisfy anybody on my end, at least. Um, and then um, I'll just change course to Allison's um, earlier comment about the block scheduling. I know it's, a, it's not the topic we're talking about right now, but I'm just going to hit all the comments. Um, and, uh, and just say that um, I actually like the idea of block scheduling because I'm a fan of PBL, and I think it's an important part of PBL. But I think your comments is Allison still here? There she is. I think your comments about it not maybe being used that way is, 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 a, is, a, is a valid comment. I'm not really sure myself, but if the block scheduling time isn't being used in a constructive way with hands-on projects and things of that nature, then, then I, I get your concern. Um, so that's something we could talk about a little bit more. Um, I'm a fan of block scheduling, but if it's used in a productive, ro robust way as part of, as part of pro project-based learning. Um, did I have anything else? No, it's Ms. pretty much I, it. Go ahead, shoot. Oh, I was going to say, ask um, uh, Dr. Goodman. Also, um, Mrs. Vasquez asked about. I the, thought I was just going to oh, talk okay. about that. Okay. okay. So, to. first of all, mm -hmm. if anybody wants homeschooling, that's your schooling your child, there's a process. You can call Mr. Keogh's <coughs> office or, um, tomorrow and set that up there it, you can still do that so um i just want Ms. vasquez or whoever whoever else wants it you uh, people are still you know i only heard from one other person so you can do that too if you're interested so there there isn't a stop on that so i just want to make sure that you knew that i know it's a crazy year so please contact mr keogh's office secondly as um as pete said the it moves. Uh, the, the variant has made a difference in my mind as it has in the board's mind. But, you know, New York State also came out at that same time, right after we did our, our, our um, resolution, that you can choose the preschool model. They also were thinking that way. Wrongly so. And you know what happened? Two weeks later, which is what we always meant if something happened, we just made the mask requirement 
because we saw that, you know, not only children, we don't want to lose our faculty. We don't want them to be sick, and we don't want to have to get substitutes because that could cause us to go remote in and of itself. So um, it's a moving target. Um, Great Britain is a good example, but I think a lot of more people are vaccinated there, and hopefully we'll get some more information on that. And now that the FDA approved the Pfizer vaccine, I think the vaccine hesitant, maybe um, some of those people want to look at that again, because it will make a difference. We are below the Westchester average here. Um, you know, and I, you saw that chart, some, some uh, many communities are, you know, we have Mount Vernon below us and some Yonkers areas and New Rochelle, but a lot of the suburban areas are higher vaccination rates than we are. And we should think about why that is. Um, I'm not quite sure. Maybe um, we could have some um, physician, because that did come out in the survey that people want to learn about it, and we will set something like that up. We have an expert right in our audience tonight. So um, he studies COVID. So that, I think we have great resources in the community. Again, I was wrong at that time. I didn't know that it was going to go this way. Um, but again, you know, we, all we wanted to do was look at the data. And hopefully at some point, there will be some data that will tell us that we don't have to do this forever. And it could be the vaccines. We need to find out what it is, but we need to get a hold of this virus so we can go back to normal. You know, what, what, what Again, like I said before, it's how we present it to our kids, too. I know that they, if we ask them, they don't want to do it. But if we are more matter of fact about it, like we were last year, they really were able to do it. It may not be their first choice, but I know we can get through it. This is a great community. I, don't, I think we've handled this really well, I have to say. I've watched a few other board meetings. And I know there's, and I respect everybody's um, differing opinions, but I think you guys have done a great job. So thank you for all your flexibility. You no, know, one of the things we should consider maybe doing while the state is sort of taking back over control, or at least they plan to, in the event that things flatten out and now they, they try and put it back onto the districts again. In, the, in that time frame, maybe we should talk about with our health and wellness committee developing some metrics if, we, if, if it is brought back to us, about where we think, with, with their guidance, the right metrics would be to remo do, do things like remove masks. Like what mm -hmm. is, you know, hospitalizations, infection rates, what, what's, because it's a moving target and we keep talking about it. Um, but you know, back in July at point four, if that's not low enough, when is low enough? So like, so maybe we need to, maybe there's a good reason not for it not to have been, but. But I'm saying that maybe in this time period, we should be talking about what those metrics would look like if in the event this, this state shifted back over to us again. I think and, and we have to make that decision. I think we do have experts on our health and wellness committee and maybe we could take and have, and we had a physician here today who can maybe join our health and wellness committee. Um, mm -hmm. We do, we welcome, we really want people in the medical field to join so we can broaden it. I'd like to say that tonight. And maybe we can lead in that way and find out what is the mitigation? What can we do that works best? And also what can we encourage our community and, to do? And that's also if it doesn't go against what, what some of us in our community want. So we sh probably should have done that last time, last meeting, because um, I know that that came up. So I just wanted to stick to that and, and stick to the same process. We have these committees in place with these experts. This is their lane, then we should be Right. following yeah I but the, the committee had decision. met though not that long before yeah. then though, well so. the committee to yeah, be, but the committee did not so the committee to be did not support the to resolution be, to be yeah. transparent and I think that what we can take away from this yeah. honestly is that looking at a two mile radius of positivity rate does not yield for good guidance when you're trying to navigate through a global pandemic and I think that's a lesson that we all learned I know right now in our area, the Delta variant is like 98 to 99% of what we're seeing. But I also know that in Texas, they're now starting to see the Lambda variant surface. And that's um, supposed to be less contagious than Delta, but more um, causing more serious illness is what I've heard through like my infectious disease um, colleagues and we meet now weekly with updates. And I think we need to heed those opinions and weigh them pretty strongly because 
I'm not surprised where we're sitting today, to be honest with you, at all. And I think that we have, we're all learning lessons and we need to kind of look at this for what it is. Unfortunately, it's not something that's just affecting our area. And we're gonna be affected by our nation probably, unfortunately, more so than we're gonna be affected by what's happening in Europe. But as a civic duty, we should find out what we can do to help move this along. You know, we are, you know, we are, we're a good community and we can find out what we can do because if each person takes their responsibility, we can get somewhere. I just hope that as the debate goes on though, that we continue to remember though, that there's another side to the coin in terms of the risk reward matrix of wearing masks long-term for kids. So again, I'm, I'm at the point now with the Delta variant going where it's going, seem, seeming to go more into the younger population, uh, not understanding where this uptick's gonna, gonna level out. Um, I'm comfortable at this point putting that decision making back in, into the hands of the health professionals. Um, but again, when, when the debate comes back, when, when things start to flatten out, and hopefully that's soon, and we get back down into the very low numbers, which I hope is very soon, if the state is persisting on the mask mandates, we gotta remember that the other side of the coin, I understand the health issue is very, very important. Obviously, we don't wanna lose a single child or a single person, but there is the quality of education, the mental aspect of it, there is, and that's quantif it's, it's not, it's qualitative, it's not quantitative, you can't put a number on it, but it can't be left out of the debate, is all I'm saying, and I, I think it's very easy to get into the health numbers and, and forget about um, what the adverse effects over a long term. And again, I don't want to be dramatic about the, the, the downside of wearing masks. I'm not trying, trying to be hyperbolic about it. I know it's just a mask, but, um, but there is some impact, I think, especially over time, compounded over time, to, to wearing masks um, from, from a negative perspective in terms of learning, emotional, social, emotional well-being and all that. So I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just saying that's the part of the debate that gets left out a lot of times, I think. And it's easy to leave it out because it's hard to, qu to quantify it. It's almost impossible to quantify it. But it's there. You can't, you can't ignore it. Well, it's something so. we'll talk about with our Health and Wellness Committee. And yeah, I said from we need the, to remember. I've been saying repeatedly that this whole pandemic, the mental health crisis that's evolved from this is just as serious. We've had more suicides, more right. suicide holds, more eating disorders diagnosed than we have I, I can't remember in my career, to be honest with you, and the American Academy of Pediatrics has said that suicide now supersedes motor vehicle accidents. So the mental health part of this is for sure a huge, huge issue. I think that honestly, even when we talk about like lockdown drills, when our kids first started doing that, that was, that was traumatic. Like there are many things, and I don't think wearing a mask is comparable to a lockdown drill. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, this is the world that we're living in and we're raising our kids in, and I feel like it's our parental responsibility not to increase their anxiety by making it such a big deal. I think kids feed off of us, of the what we say, how we respond to things, what we do, and if, if it's not a big deal, it's not a big deal. If we're gonna make it a big deal, it's gonna become a very big deal. And I feel like um, we need to know that you're, I, you're, this is not going away. I don't think vaccines are gonna solve everything. I do think it's going to help mitigate it. From what I've heard, this the Delta will surge the late September, early October, and then start to decline from a couple of different you know, institutions, not just mine. And, and the last thing I'll say too is I think what we have to keep an eye on as a, as a community, as a society, I think is, I think we're far enough along in this pandemic that we need to pay attention to what the outcomes are per, per group. I think in the beginning it made sense to just be all in this as one group um, in the sense that, you know, the whole idea was to stop the spread and, and to flatten the curve and all, and all that. But what, what concerned me before Delta was that it seemed like kids were being told to mask in order to help stop the spread amongst adults that were vaccine eligible and, and weren't getting vaccinated. Um, you know, what, again, what's changed now at Delta is it seems like there's more, there's more of an adverse effect to younger people, which is a game changer, of course. But as we move along, I think we need to look at those two groups 
and look at outcomes and not necessarily be myopic and put everybody into one basket. Um, so I get the community, the idea of community, I understand that, but, but at the same time, um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily right to, to, um, to, to not be more targeted in how we do things. So, but anyway, the bottom line is, is that as of right now, it's out of our hands. Um, and given the uncertainties of Delta and the growing trend, I, th I think that's a good thing right now. Um, and then we'll see where it goes. And uh, this board has been flexible. This school district, this superintendent, this board has been flexible all the way through and will continue to be so. So, yep. all right, good? good? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Strategy good? All right, so that's it. We're going to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Lori, second Laura. All in favor? Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>